Today, uh, we uh, have a special guest who I think many of you know very well already. I was just talking to Paul Mounsey about the fact that he probably needs no introduction to this group. But as you know, Paul joined our uh, Division of Cardiology now how long ago at this point? 18 months. 18 months. And is director of our uh, EP uh, service and is going to discuss a topic today which I think is becoming more and more important and that is why don't we implant automatic defibrillators into our heart failure patients at UNC and I think he will, will answer that uh, for us and give us the current statistics. I've worked with Paul on a number of patients and have been just greatly impressed by his dedication uh, to patient care and, and so I think you'll enjoy his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that kind introduction. It's uh, always a pleasure to, to uh, uh, address uh, Grand Rounds uh, here, at, uh, h here in my home hospital. It's, it's interesting. It's a very, and this has happened completely by accident, that uh, one of my colleagues, Sid Smith, had a paper published in JAMA very recently pointing out how the evidence base for a lot of the guidelines which we use for our clinical practice is actually quite deficient. And one of the interesting um, things about the evidence base of the guidelines that I'm about to talk about today is that the evidence base is actually pretty secure. It, the evidence that I'm going to give you is based on large, prospective, double-blind, randomized, randomized multi-center trials in large cohorts of people, and frequently the evidence is, is, has, has, been met, has, has been subject to meta-analysis of large, randomized trials, and all the data points very much in, in the same direction. I, I was kind of looking for, a, for, for an emotive title that might make people a little angry when I was uh, trying to prepare this talk. And, and so I, um, I said, why don't we implant automatic defibrillators in our heart failure patients at UNC? And in fact, we're not so very different here from, from an awful lot of um, hospitals up and down the country, as, as I will show you. The, um, I suppose the difference between how we manage at UNC and how other uh, major institutions manage is that, that large teaching institutions usually do somewhat of a better job than we do at putting automatic defibrillators into people with heart failure. And I think that's probably, the, the reason that we don't here is probably the fault more than anything of the cardiology division in, in educating our colleagues about, about, about high-tech aspects of of heart failure management. Heart failure management is a, is, is a holistic thing, if ever there was one, and many physicians within the Department of Medicine manage patients with heart failure. You have to manage the patient's lifestyle, the patient's medications, you have to think about why they've got it, you have to think about can you reverse it, and if you can't reverse it, then you have to think about the more high-tech things that we do in the Division of Cardiology, which include defibrillator implantation, which is what I'm going to talk about today, but also what the Heart Failure Transplantation Service can offer in terms of mechanical circulatory support, etc., and so forth. So with that introduction, let's, let's move on. And my conclusions today is going to be to remind you all that the commonest cause of death in the United States is still um, sudden cardiac arrest. It is mu a much commoner cause of death than, for example, any form of cancer. You have to lump all cancers together before they become a, a commoner cause of death than sudden cardiac arrest. And that there are two large trials, the MADE-IT-2 trial and the scud heft trial, um, which guide primary prevention automatic defibrillator implantation. Let's think about what that means. Primary prevention, primary prevention means putting a defibrillator into somebody who's not yet had a cardiac arrest. The trouble is, if you wait till somebody's had a cardiac arrest, 95% of your patients are going to die because only 5% of people survive cardiac arrest to hospital discharge. So if we're going to make an impact on sudden death mortality, the biggest killer of Americans, um, we're going to have to do it before they have their cardiac arrest. We have to do it with primary prevention. Um, and there are good trials to back that statement up. And unfortunately, what we'd all like to do is to be able to pick out of the heart failure pool the patients who are actually going to die suddenly, because you're all thinking, but a minority of these patients die suddenly, and the answer is, that's true. Or it, it actually isn't, because it's one of those things where you don't see it very often in your own individual clinic. 
and so you don't think it happens very often. It actually does happen relatively frequently, and it's very difficult to pick out patients with heart failure who are going to die suddenly. And beyond knowing what their ejection fraction is, their New York Heart Association class, and the state of their kidneys, there's really no risk stratifiers that are useful in 2009. And finally, and, and perhaps most controversially, I'd like to, to demonstrate, uh, to hopefully to your satisfaction today, that although defibrillators are clearly very expensive, the cost of defibrillators are similar to quite a lot of other things that we do, a lot of other life-saving therapies, for example, statins, which we prescribe without too much of a second thought these days. Okay, so here's what we're in the process of talking about. This is an episode of uh, sudden cardiac death happens at 6 o'clock in the morning, as these things do, and the patient begins with sustained monomorphic ventricular tachycardia that begins with a couple of R on T ectopics here. That degenerates into ventricular fibrillation and finally into asystole over a period of eight or nine minutes. We don't know that this is what happens to everybody who dies suddenly of sudden cardiac arrest, because the only evidence that we really have is, fact, is, is fortuitously getting a, a, a monitored sudden cardiac death event on a halter monitor, and that's, this, this is what always happens when you happen to have a halter monitor on. The point is that not everybody who dies has a halter monitor, and there must, be, must have been some reason to put the halter monitor on the patient in the first place. But to the best of our knowledge, this is what happens when people die suddenly. They die overwhelmingly in the majority of cases from tachyarrhythmias. I just want to make the point here that 300 and odd thousand, probably a little higher than that now, uh, people per annum die of uh, sudden cardiac arrest in the United States. It's one of the leading causes of death, compare, compare, comparing it with stroke, lung cancer, breast cancer, age. You can make all these comparisons uh, that you like. The issue is that it's, it is a common cause of death. And the overwhelming majority of people who die suddenly, about 80%, die from coronary artery disease. Again, this is United States population. If you go to different parts of the world, it's going to be a different um, disease mix. But in the United States currently, overwhelmingly, the majority of people will be dying of coronary artery disease. That will be the cause of the impairment of left ventricular systolic function that leads to the sudden cardiac death. About 15% will have dilated cardiomyopathy and 5% will have the funnies, the, the things that uh, get my pulse racing like iron channel abnormalities, congenital heart disease, long QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome, and all the things that I spend my life trying to find in the patients that I see but don't see it so often, unfortunate, well, fortunately, probably for the general population. So let's look at class 2, class 3, and class 4 congestive cardiac failure, and let's look at the mode of death of these patients. Uh, patients with class 2 congestive cardiac failure, two-thirds of them nearly will die suddenly. In class 3 congestive cardiac failure, about 60% will die suddenly. And it's only when you survive to reach class 4 congestive cardiac failure that the proportion of people dying suddenly starts to reduce and become a, a minority of the modes of death of heart failure patients and in fact death from progressive pump failure becomes more pronounced. But in the majority, the vast majority of our heart failure patients who have class 2 and class 3 heart failure, the mode of death will be sudden cardiac death secondary to ventricular tachyarrhythmias. If we want to prevent sudden cardiac death, then the whole story is not to put defibrillators into people. We have to do the simple things correctly. We have to follow the heart failure guidelines. If they've got coronary artery disease, we need to treat the coronary artery disease aggressively. This is data, it's ancient data now from the 1980s, comes from one of the early uh, coronary surgery studies, but it makes the point, which is as true now as it was then, that among patients with multi-vessel coronary disease, and the graph looks the same for two-vessel coronary disease, if you treat their coronary disease surgically where surgical treatment is appropriate and compare that with patients randomized to medical treatment, the sudden death mortality is definitely reduced. 
So ischemia, control of ischemia is very important in heart failure patients if you want to prevent sudden cardiac death. Um, in addition to that, you have to do all the various things that we do on a fairly routine basis for heart failure patients. And this talk really isn't about the incidence of uh, ACE a prescription of ACE inhibitor and beta blocker and spironolactone where appropriate, but keeping within those guidelines will not only improve the sense of well-being of heart failure patients, but will also improve the mortality and specifically the sudden death mortality of heart failure patients. The treatment that has the most traction in prevention of sudden cardiac death after control of ischemia is beta blockade, and there is no doubt that if you use high-dose metoprolol or, or carvedilol in heart failure patients, sudden death mortality will be reduced. Let's have a look at how we do, how, how we do with, uh, with, 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 with how we've been doing with the incidence of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest over the last, what, 20, nearly 30 years. If you look back to 1979, 1980, to that, to what, the, that one year, you can see in comparison with 1989-1990 or 1990-2000, between 1980 and 2000, there was a significant reduction in cardiac arrest, in the incidence of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, as reported by emergency rooms in the United, as reported by emergency medical technician groups in the United States, and that reduction in cardiac arrest has been caused almost entirely by a reduction in ventricular fibrillation. And in fact, a systole and pulseless electrical activity, which are much more end-stage forms of cardiac arrest, really haven't changed. So why do you think that, these, that the incidence of cardiac arrest has reduced? And I think the reason that the incidence of cardiac arrest has reduced over the last 30 years has been the very much more aggressive treatment of coronary disease that we have been doing and the very much wider usage of the various heart failure medications, beta blockade, especially um, in patients with weak hearts. The point is, though, that we've got down to a, a point here where we've maybe halved the incidence of ventricular fibrillation, but from 1990 to 2000, which is when defibrillators really became available and started to be exploited in a big way, we're not really seeing the reduction in ventricular fibrillation cardiac arrest that we should be seeing and I put it to you, that's probably because the patients are not getting defibrillator therapy. Because there is a resi residual risk of sudden cardiac death, if you look at the treatment arms of CHF beta blocker trials, this uh, slide compares the uh, Sibis trial, which used bisoprolol, Merit HF, which used metoprolol, and the uh, carvedilol trials, there is still an incidence of sudden cardiac death even despite adequate doses of beta blockers and in these patients in these studies also adequate doses of ACE inhibitors and spironolactone and diuretics and all the other things that we do for our heart failure patients. And it was data such as these that led to a series of trials actually through the 1990s but the important two trials in the 1990s were the MADIT2 trial and the SCUD-HEF trial. The MADIT-2 trial was, to my mind, actually a very elegant trial because it asked a very simple question. It said, if you have an ejection fraction, a left ventricular ejection fraction of 30% or less, if you are in New York Heart Association class 1 to 3, i.e. the vast majority of heart failure patients, and you didn't have end-stage renal disease, if we put a defibrillator into you, into half, into half, actually, a third of the patients, and no def I'm sorry, a defibrillator into two-thirds and no defibrillator into a third, would it impact mortality? And the answer is the trial was stopped early. It clearly did impact mortality. The curves, the uh, Kaplan-Meier curves, separated at about a year and were continuing to separate at the time the trial was called at about three years. All, uh, the, the, these were, and I won't belabor the point because I know we've spoken about this in the past at, uh, at Medicine Grand Rounds, but this was a very well medicated group of patients, very high incidence of ACE inhibition, very high incidence of beta blockade, 
coronary disease was treated appropriately, and yet a defibrillator would make an impact of about 30% or more on the relative risk of mortality at about three years. Scud Heft trial, an NIH study that was um, the second important trial that guides our practice in defibrillator implantation, um, took a slightly different group of patients. You had to have ischemic heart disease to get into made it too. If I didn't say that, I apologize. In Scud Heft, you could get into the study. All you needed to get into the study was an ejection fraction of less than 35%, left ventricular ejection fraction less than 35%, and at least New York Heart Association class 2 heart failure. So two differences in the populations. The first was in made it 2, your ejection fraction had to be less than 30, so your ejection fraction criterion was a little bit more stringent, but in made it 2, you could, you could be class 1. You could have no symptoms from your heart failure. In Scud Heft, the ejection fraction was a little higher, 35%, and that 5 percentage points makes a, lot, a large difference to the patient outcome. But you had to have at least class 2 congestive cardiac failure to get into it. And as in made it 2, you could not have terrible renal function. And in uh, Scud Heft, what was compared was treatment with amiodarone, which at the time was felt might reduce uh, sudden death because it's an antiarrhythmic drug and it might make VT go away, versus a placebo versus an ICD. And the result was that amiodarone was a placebo in this population the ICD reduced mortality by about a relative risk reduction of about 30% at the end of five years. And again, no sign of the curves coming together at the end of the study. So on the basis of those two studies, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I just want to make the point, a proportion of patients in Scud Heft had non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy the p-value isn't as good for this group of patients because they were a relatively small number of patients in the study, but the trends are exactly the same, and the statisticians tell me that it's the probability that a defibrillator is less effective in people with dilated cardiomyopathy than people with ischemic cardiomyopathy is infinitesimally small. <laughs> So trials, trials like these, and there were, there were a lot of others, but the, those are the two fundamental trials, led to uh, guidelines from the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, and the European Heart Association that were most recently updated in the spring of last year, which suggested that ICD therapy is indicated in patients with an ejection fraction less than 35% due to prior myocardial infarction, who are at least 40 days post myocardial infarction and who are in class uh, in New York Heart Association functional class two or three. That's a Scud Heft guideline based straight out of the Scud Heft trial. ICD therapy is indicated in patients with non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy who have an ejection fraction less than or equal to 35 in New York Heart Association class two and three. Again. A Scud Heft guideline comes straight, straight from the Scud Heft trial, well evidence based. ICD therapy is indicated in patients with left ventricular systolic dysfunction due to prior myocardial infarction, who are at least 40 days post myocardial infarction, who have an ejection fraction less than 30, and can be in your heart association functional class 1. All of these are very evidence based guidelines and were embraced by all the major. Um, professional bodies of, of cardiologists in, in North America and in Western Europe. So what's been the effect? These trials have been around actually for quite a long time. The guidelines get tweaked slightly, but the guidelines have essentially read like that now for probably the last three or four years. If you look at a, a publication that recently came out in the Journal of the American College of Cardiologists, uh, it's, it, it, ma it makes fairly dismal reading to my eyes. If you look at hospitals who are um, a part of the Get With the Guidelines, that's what GTWG stands for, initiative, defibrillator implantation rate in eligible patients ra ranges from 80% down to zero. The average implant rate, again, among eligible patients, is 20% of patients. The lowest tertile, the implant rate was less than 
the highest tertile, the implant rate was greater than 35%. This is a message that clearly either isn't going, get, getting out to um, the medical community, or it's a message that the medical community has chosen either to disbelieve or to ignore. I really don't know why, what, which of those answers is true, but the data is really quite striking. A couple of interesting things came out of the study. Imp ICD implant rates were highest in large centers, the University of North Carolina, with sophisticated cardiovascular facilities, the University of North Carolina. Um, for, if you compared academic centers with non-academic centers, implant rates were higher in, in get with the guidelines academic centers. Patients who offered heart transplantation, like the University of North Carolina does, had roughly a 60% implantation rate. Patient who, uh, hospitals who had the facilities for, for performing percutaneous coronary intervention, like we do, had a much higher implant, ra implant rate. And patients where you could do coronary surgery similarly. And finally, if you looked at the size of the hospital, Smaller hospitals had very low implantation rates. Hospitals like us, with more than 500 beds in them, had higher implantation rates. So how are we doing at UNC? Well, I have to tell you that we're not doing terribly well. Um, with, with the assistance of uh, one of the uh, EP Lab nurses, Freya, who's in the audience somewhere, uh, I uh, performed a, um, a, a fairly unscientific, but I think quite interesting, audit of our uh, practice at the University of North Carolina last summer. Um, we uh, studied 80%, uh, I'm sorry, we studied 80 consecutive patients who by echocardiography met the guidelines for implantation of, of an implantable defibrillator. And so by that we said they had to have an ejection fraction less than 35%. So we just studied 80 consecutive patients over a couple of months who came to the echo lab for echocardiography referred for whatever reason people wanted to refer patients. That's what makes this a slightly unscientific study. But it was consecutive patients presenting for routine echocardiography. Of those, pati of those patients, 30% already had an ICD or had an ICD implant planned. 40% had no ICD implanted and there was no plans that we could detect from a fairly careful chart review to consider implanting an ICD. And about 30% had no ICD, but again, a reasonably careful chart review made it fairly obvious that it wasn't indicated, at least at that time. And there were various reasons for that that you can probably imagine if you think of the kinds of patients that we have in this hospital. These could be patients with severe sepsis on the medical ICU. These could be uh, patients where heart failure had recently been identified and medications were being titrated. You can kind of think of the reasons why it may not be appropriate. But we're still missing 40% of patients where, where a fairly detailed chart review could see no reason why this wasn't on the agenda or being considered. Obviously, we did not go and interview the patients. We did not talk to the physicians looking after the patients. But I think the data are still quite interesting. So our implant rate on the basis of this rather unscientific survey at 30% is certainly better than a lot of hospitals. No question about that. But it's a long way away from where we should be, I put it to you, as an academic center with sophisticated cardi cardiology facilities available. So why is this? Why is, the, is there a reluctance among the medical community in this country to take up a potentially life-saving therapy that's evidence-based and guideline-based? Because heaven alone knows we're all supposed to practice on the basis of evidence and guidelines. That's what we teach our students. That's what we teach the residents. And there are lots of reasons that I can think of. One is, is, it, is this a big enough effect to make it worthwhile? The benefit of an ICD, I put it to you, could be regarded as being statistically marginal and unlikely to be of practical benefit to the patients that you're looking after. There is no doubt that if you look at the percent risk of sudden cardiac death per annum, and I'm playing devil's advocate for a minute, if you start with the adult population of the United States, the percent risk of sudden cardiac arrest is very tiny. At the other end, high-risk post-MI survivors have a very high risk of sudden cardiac arrest. 
But if you look at the number of sudden cardiac deaths, just because there are an awful lot more people in the adult population than there are who are high-risk post-MI survivors, more cardiac arrests occur, secondary to plaque rupture, in the community in the adult population than do in the population that we're looking at, which is essentially this population down here, because this is the population that we can identify using current criteria. Let's look at the scud Heff trial. Let's look at the scud Heff trial in a slightly different way from how I, I presented it to you a minute ago. Let's try and make the scud Heff trial look like a really, a, a really unimportant trial. At two and a half years, the control mortality in the scud Heff trial was 18.2. The, uh, the ICD mortality was 14.2. The p-value was 0.007. What does that mean? ICD significantly reduced sudden cardiac death by 23% at two and a half years. Or does it mean over two and a half years in 100 patients of primary prevention ICD will save four lives and 14 patients will die anyway from progressive heart failure? You want to make an ICD look bad? You put it that way. You can always make a trial result go away, which is why the famous English Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli once said that there were lies and then, of course, there are damned lies and then there are statistics. Um, I can make the, um, the study look quite different. I can, I can quote you the number needed to treat. The absolute five-year risk reduction in the scud Heff trial was 7.2%. Number needed to treat with a defibrillator to save one life over five years is 14 patients. That's a pretty good number needed to treat, my public health colleagues tell me. So you can make trial results go away if you don't like them. But I'm not sure that that's the right way to look after our patients. One thing that is definitely true, and that is that the benefit of an ICD in these trials is definitely underestimated. And the reason for that is technical, because patients who get ICDs or who got ICDs in these trials had the ICDs set up so that they would actually get a certain amount of right ventricular pacing. And we've now realized over the last, I suppose, about five years that right ventricular pacing is really bad for people with heart failure, and it definitely increases their mortality from heart failure. And if you look at patients receiving ICDs in Made It 2, they, they, they were admitted with heart failure much more commonly than patients receiving conventional therapy. That's a problem that's not going to happen any longer, but it certainly at the time diluted the benefit of ICD therapy. There have been lots of attempts to try to richen the mixture of um, patients receiving ICDs for patients who actually need them. And people look at all kinds of risk factors to try and say, this is the one that's going to die suddenly, whereas this one isn't. And we look at all sorts of things. Obviously, myocardial ischemia increases your risk. LV dysfunction increases your risk. Having a lot of non-sustained VT increases your risk. Having a lot of myocardial scar increases your risk. But all the patients with an EF of 35 have got those things or have had those things. We also look at all kinds of clever electrical things like measures of slowed intraventricular conduction because that would certainly increase your risk of having a ventricular arrhythmia and various things have been looked at. The duration of the QRS complex looked at a thing called a signal average DCG which is now of historical interest only. We look at the QT interval and this thing called T-wave alternans, which is the latest uh, flavor du jour to try to pick out people who have a higher risk of sudden cardiac death. And I'll show you some evidence about that in a second. Imbalance of, of autonomic tone, looking at baroreceptor sensitivity is another one. Trouble is, and you can do this for any of these clever measurements, they all look great till you do a prospective trial. And when you do a prospective trial, uh, the uh, this is of T-wave alternans, which is a measure of electrical instability. It doesn't predict who's going to die suddenly or not. So we've never, we haven't yet found a clever way of picking out patients who are going to die suddenly by measuring clever electrical things. I wish, wish we could, but we haven't. So let's look at the trials themselves and see if we can just pull those apart a little bit. That's been done fairly extensively for the Made It 2 trial. And the first thing that was demonstrated was that if you take people in the Made It 2 trial who had severely impaired renal function, they were a very high-risk group of patients in whom mortality was incredibly high 
at three years as high as, as, as 55 to 60 percent, and in whom a defibrillator was unhelpful. And you can derive that same result from the SCUD-HEF trial. And it's undoubtedly true that if you have patients with at least class 3 congestive cardiac failure, this is SCUD-HEF data, nothing really made a particular difference to their mortality. And if you have patients whose heart failure is that bad, then we should be considering doing other things for them rather than simply putting a defibrillator in. And one thing that we can do is consider mechanical circulatory support. We can consider biventricular pacing. Neither of these is the subject of my lecture today, but I'd be happy to discuss them during questions. But the other thing is, though, that what we know is that, that you can pull out of the made it two population things that do put people at high risk of needing a defibrillator discharge. And the two, the, the four things that have fallen out that are easy to remember is New York Heart Association class, atrial fibrillation, a wide QRS duration, older age, and a BUN, which is moderately but not severely impaired. If you have none of these things, then you are not going to be helped by a defibrillator. This is data derived, obviously, hasn't been tested yet in a prospective trial, probably never will be, but it's the best data we have. If you have none of these things, I don't think you need a defibrillator. If you have one or more of these things, you do need a defibrillator. And if you look at patients who've got one of those risk factors, they're very much helped by a defibrillator. Two of those risk factors, they're really helped by a defibrillator. Three of those risk factors, the benefit goes away. And in fact, if you use these risk factors, there seems to be a U-shaped relationship between risks and mortality. And what we should be doing is concentrating our defibrillator referrals on the people with one or two of those risk factors, because that is where we are going to see the benefit. You can derive the same answer from at least three of the large trials of defibrillators, but I think that the data from Made It 2 serves to make the point that you can clinically risk stratify patients. If you have a patient who's got terribly bad heart failure, who's got three risk factors, I said a minute ago, biventricular pacing will help. This is a study of biventricular pacing. Um, a cardiac resynchronization therapy, percentage of patients dying from any cause or a combined endpoint of worsening heart failure. If we use biventricular paces, we can definitely make these patients better. So there are other things that we can do for the patients with three and four risk factors. And I think that's an important message as well. Second controversy. ICDs are too expensive. ICDs are very expensive. The hardware costs to the hospital, I heard somebody early on as the people were coming in saying, well, the box alone costs $60,000. That's actually an, over, an overestimate. The hardware costs to the hospital are in the twenty dollars to $25,000 range, so still incredibly expensive, but not quite so bad. It doesn't have quite so much sticker shock as $60,000. Cost effectiveness of ICD therapy has proved to be very difficult to assess and it's been looked at very carefully in all the major trials. And a caveat emptor, the costs that are quoted are critically dependent on the assumptions made in making doing the sums and also on the duration of the projected benefits. When you look at ICD costs, they are quite shocking, but remember the the high charges are up front, and the benefits accrue over a period of several years. Makes the point, you don't want to put a defibrillator in somebody if you think they're going to die in the next year to 18 months, because you're never going to see the benefits. And the other thing is that if you look at the NHLBI cholesterol lowering guidelines for moderate hypercholesterolemia without any other risk factors, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio of a prescription of Lipitor is about $100,000. That's an awful lot of money, and yet we do that all the time. So let's just look at some examples of some of these calculations. In fact, this is the only example I'm going to give you because it shows how complex these calculations are. These two curves here show the Made It 2 trial. This is the ICD mortality. This is the conventional mortality. Then these lines project what happens over the next nine years. And for the conventional mortality, I'm sorry, for the conventional group, the mortality curve has just been extended parallel out to 12 years. For the ICD group, 
three projections were entertained in this particular study. One was that the patients would be immortal and that, and that they would uh, survive out to 12 years at the same rate as they did at the end of the study. And then the others make assumptions about some fall off in mortality from heart failure. And if you use these um, assumptions, obviously if you make them immortal, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio is about $80,000. And if you, if you say that the benefit of the defibrillator is going to be gone by 12 years, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio is about $114,000 and then various different estimates in between. All kinds of things we do in society cost a lot of money. My favorite uh, of all of these is the $18 million we spend in cost in, 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 for uh, every quality adjusted life year gained as we modify buildings in earthquake prone areas. But the point I think is made that we do all sorts of things that cost an awful lot of money to save people's lives. What was my other one? Oh, flammability standards for upholstered furniture were terribly, terribly expensive for the amount of benefit that we gained. So the, the third controversy I think that we're faced with is that these patients have been coming to our clinics for years. They're, you know, the man who comes in, bad heart, heart attack 10 years ago, keeps coming back to the clinic every few years. He's passed the will to live test. I don't need to do anything else for this patient. In fact, those are the patients that you need to be referring for defibrillators. The de benefit of a defibrillator over the first 18 months after you've had your cardiovascular event is actually quite small. And it's when you get out to 10 years after the cardiovascular event that you start to see the major decreases in mortality from defibrillators. <laughs> And this is a result that you can extract from other trials. The Dynamite MI trial put defibrillators into high-risk post-MI patients and the ICD in control uh, immediately after the MI. And by the end of two years, the ICD and control groups were superimposable. The, the defibrillator did not help early after the index MI. It doesn't say, mean to say you shouldn't put it in at that point, but you don't expect to see the benefit at that point. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a result that you could pull out of the post-beta blocker era, um, sudden cardiac death rates. Most arrhythmic events begin to occur in the 18 months to two year period after a, an index myocardial event, and those are the things that you prevent with a defibrillator. Median time from MI to sudden cardiac arrest was nine years. My patient's too old. Let's use the... Uh, use the ageist argument for a second. There's no doubt that sudden death is a disease of the elderly. If you look at the, these are patients dying suddenly in, in, in Oregon where they keep very good records of these things and you can see that apart from an early peak of, de of sudden death in men in the heart attack years of the 55 to 65, um, sudden death is, becomes increasingly a disease of the elderly especially among ladies and Again, no really good data looking at the elderly, but this is a uh, study of 14,000 Medicare patients admitted with a diagnosis of congestive cardiac failure, showing that the ones that received ICDs had a significantly lower mortality than the ones that did not. Not prospectively randomized data. You can all tell me what the criticisms are. I know, them, know what they are as well. But the interesting thing is that the all-cause mort mortality risk reduction in these, made, in these Medicare patients it was 0.62, which is eerily similar to the risk reduction in the Made It 2 trial. Too many ICD shocks are unnecessary. We've all seen patients coming into the emergency room with a burst of atrial fibrillation getting an ICD shock, and those of us who, like me, look after an awful lot of ICD patients know that Sometimes this can turn a, 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 a normally strong and well-functioning individual into a psychological wreck. It's actually quite rare, but, but it can happen. And occasionally patients with defibrillators who receive multiple shocks, whether they need them or they didn't need them, occasionally they actually need psychiatric treatment. And I actually do refer these patients for psychiatric treatment. It's actually quite easy to deal with the post-traumatic stress disorder that they get. The hard part is recognizing it. Interesting, if, if you look at, uh, this is a cohort of 600 patients, if you look at total detections, 
75% of total detections in this cohort were for rhythms that needed a shock. 25% were for rhythms that didn't. But count the shocks. Nearly 50% of the shocks the patients received were for rhythms that didn't need a shock. I think that's a pretty damning indictment on, on people of my kind and what we do to people. And I want you to know that it's something that we're aware of and we're actually getting better at avoiding this problem, as I'll show you in a second. There's no doubt that shocks reduce quality of life. This is uh, data taken from the uh, made it, I'm sorry, from the Scud Heft trial, which shows that if you measure various personality traits and patients who've had a shock compare poorly to patients who've never had a shock from their defibrillator. Um, this is the same analysis. Um, uh, 269 shocks, 128 were necessary, 87 were unnecessary only. 54 patients had both, nearly five years follow-up. And it's interesting, if you have shocks, you're more likely to die. Why? Because if you have it at an appropriate defibrillator discharge, what does it tell you? It tells you that the patient has a dying substrate. Normal people don't get VF, right? The people with weak hearts that get VTVF are the ones that you need to follow up their heart failure much more closely because their mortality over the next year or two is significantly higher. Interestingly, even unnecessary shocks have a higher mortality because they're usually caused by atrial fibrillation, and atrial fibrillation can be a sign that the substrate is, is deteriorating. If you have both kinds of shock, your mortality is very much higher. The more shocks you get, the more unstable your substrate, the more the hazard risk ratio of death. This is a, a shock for ventricular fibrillation in a patient. You can see the arrhythmia started somewhere over here. Here's an episode of ventricular fibrillation. It's detected by the device. It charges itself up. Bang! Patient gets a shock. Patient goes back into sinus rhythm. Of course, defibrillators can also treat uh, ventricular tachyarrhythmias, slow ventricular tachyarrhythmias, with anti-tachycardia pacing, where the defibrillator can overdrive pace the arrhythmia and the patient goes back into sinus rhythm. And it's recently become apparent that defibrillators can even overdrive pace really quite fast ventricular tachyarrhythmias. This is VT at 200 and something beats a minute. Burst of antitachycardia pacing, patient back into sinus rhythm. This is painless, it's not a shock, patient doesn't know it's happening. These therapies are too, all too frequently not turned on in defibrillators, and the reason is this. Here we have a patient in VT, Look, just look, follow the bottom trace. Patient gets a burst of antitachycardia pacing, which paces them into ventricular fibrillation, and subsequently the patient needs a defibrillator discharge to return them to sinus rhythm. Here's my favorite video, Nasty. Uh, this is a, a patient who had atrial fibrillation going on, and the device detected it as ventricular tachycardia, delivered a burst of anti-tachycardia pacing, which put the patient into real ventricular tachycardia, which required a shock to put the patient back into sinus rhythm. The details of what goes on inside a defibrillator doesn't really matter to anybody in this audience except me. Why? Because I'm the guy that's responsible for programming the devices. What you guys need to know is that if patients are having shocks that you don't think they need, you need to send them to me so I can reprogram the device and stop it from happening. Because if I do smart programming of the device, I can make all shocks go, all, I can make all shocks reduce to about 50% of what they would be with non-smart programming of the device. And as I said, the details don't matter, they're too nerdy. But if you compare standard device programming with smart device programming, you can actually get the number of shocks down a lot. Interestingly, you can get the number of shocks down for VTVF by aggressively programming the anti-tachycardia pacing, and you can get the number of shocks for a fib down by aggressively programming the way the device tells the difference between AFib and VT. So what's a doctor to do? What are you guys to do? I've given you a tirade and I'm expecting aggressive questions in about one minute's time. I think that we underuse defibrillators in our patients at the University of North Carolina. I think the evidence for that is quite clear. I think one of the, 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 there are several reasons for that. 
But the main reason is that when we see patients with weak hearts in our clinics, it's just not on the agenda. You walk in, the patient walks into the clinic, and you say, hi, Fred, how are you doing? And Fred says, oh, I'm doing fine, just the same as always. I can get a couple of blocks down to the, down to the coffee shop and a couple of blocks the other way to get a beer. And I'm doing fine, and you review the therapies, and you look at the renal function. You maybe do an ECG, and you say, oh, this is all fine. Heart attack 10 years ago, you're doing fine. It's, a defibrillator's not on the agenda. And I think that that is the single biggest reason that defibrillators are not being implanted because they're not in the mind of the person who's seeing the patient, whether it's a primary care doctor, whether it's a general cardiologist, whatever. Remember, you can send me or one of my two colleagues or any of the cardi cardiology group a patient and you can say to them, do you think this patient needs a defibrillator? And we will give you an opinion. You don't need to remember all this risk stratifying stuff. We'll remember it for you, that's what we do. But we will talk to the patient, if you appropriately prepare the patient and say, look, there are these funny devices that these doctors have that may just save your life. Why don't you go and talk to them about whether it might be a good idea? We will counsel the patient about it. We will talk to the patient about it. We will, if necessary, with your permission, of course, refer the patient on to the heart failure group so that they can offer the patient mechanical assist devices, et cetera, and so forth, if the patient needs them. But the point is, we're not going to just perform a technical service. We're physicians just like you are. We're going to talk to the patient and try and do the right thing for the patient. And that, I think, is the message that I would like to leave you with. We're actually uh, taking the data over the next few months uh, of, of, our, of our echocardiographs, and, um, and, and we're going to try to just extend that study, that survey that we did, a little bit. And we're going to involve, try to involve the person who asks for the echo in, by, in, 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 in taking ownership of the impaired ejection fraction. What we'd like to do is we'd like to offer a service where, where not the electrophysiology group, because we we're not really the people to do it, but maybe the heart failure service could offer patients who want it a one-time consultation to try and decide whether more sophisticated treatments for heart failure would be appropriate for that patient. And if you don't want it, you say, no, that's fine. But the issue is that we're trying to get the more high-tech treatments onto the agenda for patients who need them, who have weak hearts at the University of North Carolina. Because in the final analysis, all we want to do is look after our patients. And thank you for your attention. I'd welcome any questions. Sir? Do you have an age cutoff? I do not have an age cutoff. The question is, do I have an age cutoff that I use for implantation of defibrillators? I'm, I'm uninterested in, in chronological age as a reason for deciding on any form of therapy, really. I, I try to talk to the patient, and I try to assess the patient's prognosis from, the, from anything else that's wrong with the patient. And I've certainly implanted defibrillators to, into octogenarians who want them. I don't have, I, I don't do cutoffs anymore. Andrew. Are you having any problems with third party reimbursement issues in terms of debating? Is it really the indication? No, in fact, we don't. And one of the things that we, I'm sorry, the question is, have we had any, um, any problems with reimbursement for, for defibrillator implantation? And, and the interesting thing is that defibrillators are so expensive up front that every, every group in the country that puts defibrillators in are exquisitely sensitive to practicing to the guidelines. We have to practice to the guidelines because we only put one defibrillator in that isn't to guideline, that isn't reimbursed, and Gary's going to be down on us like a ton of bricks. Gary, Mr. Parks is going to be saying, you can't be doing this, because this is a, a, a bill for $30,000 that I've got to eat. In addition to that, every primary prevention defibrillator that is implanted actually goes into a registry that's administered by the ACC. And again, that's by mandate. We, we have no choice about this. 
And every single device that goes in has to go into guideline, and that is something that is audited constantly by the American College of Cardiologists. So we just never put non-indicated defibrillators in. We just can't in terms of practical politics. Sir? Mm-hmm. Okay, so the question is cabbages versus, versus stents. And the data that I showed you deliberately was quite old data, and it was data from the pre-angioplasty stent era. The point I was trying to make was not that coronary surgery prevents sudden cardiac death, but that aggressive treatment of myocardial ischemia, whether it be with stents or, or other forms of mechanical revascularization, or indeed with aggressive medical treatment of myocardial ischemia with beta blockade, actually all of those three things make sudden cardiac death go away. Any more? Sir? What's the majority of the devices that you're putting in, or a lot of them by the Okay, yeah, that's an excellent question. The biventricular pacemaker has not really been the subject of today's presentation, but the biventricular pacemaker is a very interesting device. It's a device that's designed for patients with at least class three congestive cardiac failure and also left bundle branch block. Because in those patients, the actual contraction of the left ventricle becomes asynchronous. And in that situation, we can improve the patient's heart failure class by pacing both the left ventricle and the right ventricle. So the ventricle, instead of working like that, works like that. And it doesn't have an energetic consequence like other forms of inotropes. In fact, when biventricular pacemakers came out, uh, everybody thought that 50% of devices we put in would be biventricular. It's not actually turned out to be the case because the proportion of people with class three congestive cardiac failure and left bundle branch block is really quite small. Um, so I would say in this institution, it's in the 15 to 20% range, which, which fits in with, with nationally accepted norms. The interesting thing about Bybee pacemakers is that there is a study called Made It CRT, which is, out at the, which is finished enrollment and in follow-up at the moment, where we've taken patients with class two congestive cardiac failure and left bundle branch block, and we're putting biventricular devices into those or single chamber defibrillators and looking for a, a benefit in halting the progression of heart failure, halting the progression of heart failure admissions, and maybe improving mortality. And there is data that suggests that all of those things may turn out to be true, but we don't yet have that data. So at the moment, to get a biventricular device by guideline, and I practice by guideline, um, you have to have class three congestive cardiac failure and a wide QRS complex, usually left bundle branch block. Any more? Ah, oh, sir. Uh, do you put any effect, any meaning on diastolic dysfunction? Uh, and again, uh, diastolic dysfunction patients, in fact, do not have the incidence of sudden cardiac death that we see in patients with with chronic systolic left ventricular dysfunction. So uh, currently, we don't. We're not looking at putting defibrillators into patients with chronic systolic dysfunction. Interestingly, whether or not biventricular pacing helps people with diastolic dysfunction and left bundle branch block is an area of intense study, which is still very much in the small feasibility proving trial stage at the moment, and certainly not ready for prime time. Well, I think we've uh, run out of time. I'd like to thank Paul for a very, very thoughtful.